to say good morning, Harvest Fellowship. Morning. I don't think I've stood here since. You get a thumbs up. Thanks. <laughs> I've you know I haven't stood here since March, I think sometime in March. Um, so I hope everybody had a, a good and gentle July Fourth. It's kind of funny. Um, we had uh, Frank Booker and his son over, and we we smoked some ribs and. I had some fireworks that I uh, snagged in Tennessee a couple years ago, and we set those off in the driveway. We just had a great July 4th. Then this morning we got up, we get out to the car, and uh, I look, and there's the neighbors, and they're picking up all these little sticks all over the cul-de-sac in their yard, and I went, oh, no. <laughs> That's right. You know, they come down. <laughs> So we had to go drive them, stop in the middle of the cul-de-sac and apologize, and, and, uh, but they thought it was pretty cool, you know, and, and they said, just stay in the car, we got it, you know. We got, we, they, some, one of them, uh, he said, I thought some kids were shooting off fireworks. I said, well, yeah, that's sort of true, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so the morning started out humbly, um, and I think I needed that. So uh, in that note, in that vein, let's pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you, Lord, for, uh, for getting us here in the sanctuary, Father, for drawing our hearts here. Um, it's so special, and, and what you've been doing in this world um, over the last few months is uh, bringing us together in such a different way. Um, Lord, we, we miss each other, and it's good to see faces. And Father, uh, my prayer is that we can uh, uh, meet in some semblance to normal over the next uh, the next few months, um, hopefully in in one gathering, uh, instead of having to divide it up, Lord. But uh, we look to you for guidance, Father. We ask you to bless our songs today and uh, our worship and our teaching and our reading, Father. Uh, we know you're here with us, um, and I thank you, Lord. And I thank you especially for the sacrifice of your precious Son, Lord, that uh, brings us all in uh, reconciliation to you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for uh, call to worship. I'm going to need my glasses. I usually do a bigger font. This is from Psalm 8. We're singing some songs today about uh, creation and our teaching uh, today from uh, Day Kim, who's uh, uh, coming here to guest preach for us um, from uh, Cornerstone um, on uh, the great architect. So I thought this was appropriate. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. God, all nature sings thy glory, and thy works proclaim thy might. Order vastness in the heavens, order course of day and night. Beauty in the changing seasons, beauty in the soaring sea. All the changing moods of nature changeless But our 
sins have spoiled thine image, nature, conscience only serve as unceasing grim reminders of the wrath which we deserve. Yet thy grace and saving mercy in thy word of truth reveal. Claim the praise of all who know thee in the blood of Jesus' nature sings God's glory, and sometimes we forget to do that. Sometimes we, as the crowning creation of God, uh, made in his image, we neglect to reflect that image. We neglect to bring him praises, but that's why we've come here today. Thank you for joining us. That's why we've come here today. We can do it on our own, but there's something different about doing it here collectively with the church, the body of believers. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great Jehovah. Come not only to praise the King of Kings, the triune God, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, but we also have come to listen to His Word, listen to the preaching of His Word. That's, there's more to worship than just singing songs and praising. 
There's also learning, growing, and soaking in God's message to us. significance of what we just said. And by grace, we'll stand on your promises. There is no standing without God's grace. And by faith, we'll walk as you walk with us. There is no walking through this life without, God, without faith. <laughs> it's pretty powerful. Let's sing this page one more time. And by grace will stand on your promises, and by faith will walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Amen. Please have a seat.
grace and by faith. Uh, join me in, in prayer um, as we offer up our prayers uh, to the Lord, um, our pastoral prayers, our prayers for the congregation and for his church. Father God, again, uh, Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for being such a loving Lord and a loving Father whose children can approach you freely and come to your feet and look up into your eyes and pray uh, and pray their worries and their fears uh, onto you. Father, uh, we continue to pray for Bob and Kathy, uh, the loss of Kathy's sister Marjorie. Um, Lord, we know that uh, we know she's with you and uh, she was ready. Um, so Father, I, I ask that you uh, bless that family and, uh, and continue to give them peace. Lord, we pray for uh, Susan Gill's family for the loss of their daughter-in-law's brother, Eric. Lord, bring uh, peace and, and faithful closure to that family. Lord, the, the type that uh, is reliance on you. Father, I pray that you use an opportunity like this to, uh, to reach into their hearts and for them to, to receive it. Father, I pray for Judy Burkhart's nephew, Danny, uh, who's been diagnosed with COVID-19 and has one of these comorbidities. So he's pretty sick, um, Lord. But I thank you that um, he is uh, in recovery, but it's a rough one. So, Father, uh, I ask that you uh, encourage him and encourage the family. Lord, I pray for uh, the Wellers um, as they look after Jane's mother, Mary Alice. Father, I pray for the session, uh, Lord, as we uh, work through this time of transition. Um, Lord, we, uh, we are so thankful that, uh, that you've brought us a, a shepherd, uh, but he won't be starting for a little while, so we've got some uh, T's to cross and I's to dot, Lord, but we know that you'll provide. You always have, and, uh, and we have faith in that, Lord. Um, but I, I just pray for encouragement for Scott and I um, and for uh, Barry, uh, Barry Noel, uh, during this time. Lord, and I pray for Barry and his family. Uh, th this is like a, anybody who's moved, we know what that's like. And um, there's just so many things to do and so many details and things that hinge on other things. And, and uh, we're scratching our heads a little bit, Lord, but we know your timing Sometimes it has nothing to do with us, that there's something else that, that we can't see, um, Lord. So we have faith that, uh, that your timing is, is, is the right way, um, Lord. So just give us patience. Give us patience in that, Father, and keep us, uh, keep us encouraged and keep us thankful and praying every day a prayer of thanks for what you're doing at Harvest Fellowship. Lord, I lift up this congregation um, as a whole in the same way. Um, Father, they've, they've been a faithful congregation. Lord, um, you've touched so many hearts here, and um, I feel so blessed to be an elder of, the, of this flock. Um, so, Lord, thank you, and, and I ask you to continue to encourage and lift up uh, the congregation of Harvest Fellowship. And, Lord, outside of these walls, Lord, I pray for Karenet Pregnancy Center. Um, and the, the, the work they're doing, Father, um, I know that they're looking for people, Lord. I pray that you send saints that way um, to do that very special and really, really important work. Lord, this country, I, I thank you for our celebration yesterday, Lord. This is a, a place you've given us where we're safe and we're free um, to worship. Um, Lord, we have our faults. And we're seeing some of those, um, Lord, and I, I, I pray your blessings on this nation to continue, um, Lord, that uh, we can come to grips with uh, just forming a more perfect union of, uh, of sinners. Lord, I pray uh, globally for your church. Some aren't free at all. Some are hiding. Some have to, to literally hide to worship and uh, you know, uh, I can't even imagine uh, what it's like to, to have to sing in hushed voices so that the authorities don't hear and then come and, and take people away or worse. Lord, I pray for those in this world that aren't reached yet. Father, specifically a people group in China 
the Nosu Yin Yinua. Father, uh, I pray that um, that you reach them. They have ge uh, geographical uh, obstacles, literally, and there's like no way in, no way out, Lord, but that doesn't stop you. Uh, so, Father, I, I pray that you can overcome those barriers, that you will overcome those barriers and bring the, the good news of Jesus Christ to these unchurched people in, uh, in China. Um, I pray these things, Father, uh, in the name of your precious Son, Lord, who paid the price for all of us uh, so that we can come to you and we can know you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. It's, uh, it's actually very good to be back, not just at Harvest today, but it's actually to be back in front of people. Um, <laughs> at Cornerstone, we've also been preaching and staring at a small camera uh, for, for many weeks. And uh, it's just good to see people and hear your, your laughter and to hear a reply back and know that um, you're not talking to a wall. Um, so uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct in assuming we also are live streaming this service and I believe the camera over there, I just want to uh, give a small disclaimer uh, to the people watching at home. Um, if you wanted to stare into my eyes more deeply, I apologize. There's actually more real people here, so my eyes may be averted to uh, scan the room. And for people in the room, the same one, uh, the same apology. If you've been wanting to stare at my eyes, I know they're, they're irresistible. Um, I will try my best to, um, to look at, across the room, but uh, I don't want to neglect the people watching at home. So please do not charge me with the sin of partiality. Um, <laughs> but I'm trying to accommodate everyone here, so you're all blessed. With that said, uh, please open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. We'll be covering from verse 12 to 18. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 18. And I believe it'll be up on your screen there if you don't have your Bibles with you. Let me read this passage for us. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Please pray with me for God's blessing on his word. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we have a God who's committed to us, that week in and week out, whether during COVID or not, Lord, we have a God who does not social distance from us. But Lord, you are personal, and as we sang earlier, you walk with us. And Father, I just pray that as your, as your church, your children gather this morning, whether virtually or in, in, in person, Lord, may you be faithful to bless us through your word. May it be you speaking. May it be your spirit that pricks our hearts. May it be your spirit that convicts us of our sin. But it may it also be your spirit that strengthens us to run to Jesus for forgiveness and his grace. So Father, we pray that your, your people may listen and that your word uh, may show us Christ. May we fall in love with him as we see him through your word pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a story that, um, that goes like this. There was once a, an, an Amish family that went, that never been to the city. It was a couple and their young daughter, and they'd never been to the city. So one day they decided to go visit the city, and they decided to go check out and take a stroll downtown D.C. among the outlet section with a bunch of stores. And walking down the street, the, the father, he stumbles upon a Home Depot 
And he's never seen a Home Depot before, so he, he's amazed at the a range of all these tools and all these accessories. So he goes inside and tells his wife and his daughter to just go ahead without him, and then he'll catch up. So the mo mother and the daughter, uh, they go down the street, walking down the street until they see the sight of a tinted revolving door. They've never seen a revolving door before. So they looked up at the name of the store and they read this, Adidas, impossible is nothing. Immediately they saw a man roughly in his 50s with a bald spot on his head with a little bit of a beer belly uh, who did not look very athletic disappear from one side of the revolving doors and out the other came a young, tall, <laughs> muscular, full of hair young man and all of a sudden, the daughter exclaims, it's true, nothing is impossible. To which the mother replies, go get your father. Right? <laughs> now, sometimes we wish maturity and change and uh, growth would be quick and magical, don't we? But change, maturity, and growth, as everybody knows, and if you've experienced this, it, it takes time, and it certainly takes a lot of effort on behalf of the person and also the people around them. Likewise, when it comes to the Christian life and our faith, faith, growth, and maturity is not magical, is not uh, immediate or instant like your ramen noodles that you cook at home, right? But rather, it takes time. It takes conscious effort, and it definitely takes a lot of help from the outside, uh, outside of ourselves. In our passage this morning, Paul wants to address how followers of Christ grow, change, and mature. And specifically, he's addressing this gradual transformation of the believer into being more and more like Christ each day. So if there's any, anything you get out of this sermon, any one-point summary would be this. It is God's pleasure to work in you. So work out your salvation with joy and delight. It is God's pleasure to work in you. So work out your salvation with joy and delight. In this passage, Paul tells us that when we are united to Jesus, we are gradually transformed to be three things. Workers, lights, and a city. Workers, lights, and a city. So let me explain uh, these as we go through each. So first, we're transformed to be workers. Our passage begins in verse 12 with a therefore. And if you are a, if you like your grammar, so the first thing that you have to ask is, what is that therefore? Therefore. And just to give you a quick recap of the earlier verses in ver chapter 2, Paul spends the first half of chapter 2 explaining how Jesus is the perfect example of humility for us. See, he tells us that the God of the universe takes on human flesh he humbles himself to experience what it's like to be human and willingly chooses to suffer the wrath of God, dies in the place of sinners. And Paul tells us in verse 9 that because of his perfect obedience to his father, Jesus' story did not end in humiliation and crucifixion, but rather it ended in exaltation and resurrection. And because this is true, because this this little synopsis is true. Paul in verse 12 reminds believers that if you believe in Jesus, you have been united to him as well. And whatever is true of Christ will be true of you. Just as Christ was exalted, so too you will be exalted. See, just as Christ has found favor with his Father, so too you have found favor with God the Father. It is on this very foundational uh, truth of grace and promise that Paul moves on to encourage the Philippian believers to, therefore, because this is true, therefore, obey in living out Christ-centered lives, whether they have Paul's presence with them or not, whether you have your senior pastor or not. The church has, greater, has a greater motivation than Paul's presence with them, they, ha they have a great promise. 
Now, Paul commands the Philippians Christians to not neglect their obedience in pursuing holiness. But we must pause here and read carefully because we have to ask this question, who is it? Who is it that works out our salvation? Who is it? Because it seems like in verse 12, it's the believers themselves. Work out your salvation. But in, immediately in verse 13, Paul is saying that for it is God who works, who works all things to, to, to will and to do in us. So we have to ask ourselves, who is it? Which one is it? And the answer is both. Let me explain. That's like a preacher's favorite answer, both, right? Because it gives us time to elaborate. Um, it's both. Now, working out your salvation refers to the process of becoming more and more like Jesus every day. And in verse 12, we find a doctrine uh, that is often referred to as progressive sanctification. And the idea is that when a person places their trust in Jesus to give them a new identity and a new purpose and salvation from the wrath of God for, for their sins, this person, they immediately, they're immediately declared righteous before God Almighty, but things don't stop there. Having been justified, declared righteous, God also sanctifies his people. In other words, he sets them apart from the world. He makes them different and bestows upon them a new identity. You're now, you're now in the world, but not of the world. We call this definitive sanctification. You've been set apart, you've been declared righteous, you're a new creation. Now, progressive sanctification is the process of being made more like Christ after you've been declared and after you've been set apart. Progressive sanctification is a daily, ongoing thing. So here is Paul's logic in verse 12. He tells the Philippians to work out their salvation, not work for their salvation. He tells them to work out their salvation, not work in your salvation. To work for your salvation would be to try to earn God's favor. Try to do good things every day so that maybe God will like you. To work in your salvation would be to work, rely on your own works and your own power so that God may like you. Or to bless yourself with the gift that God has given you. Just yourself. Don't let anybody, anybody experience that. That will be to work in your salvation. And the very reason Paul said that you can work out your salvation is because, as verse 13 tells us, God is working for your holiness. He's working for your holiness. In other words, it's not 50% you and 50% God. It's not 99% God and 1% you. But rather, God works 100% of your sanctification and you confirm that 100% in your work. God works 100% in your sanctification and you confirm the 100% in your work. See, God works and you work to confirm that work. The moment you place your faith in Christ, God works in you and you're transformed as a worker yourself. See, Paul mentions that we are to work out or confirm the grace we have received with fear and trembling. But this fear and trembling is not out of fear and trembling because we've, um, we want to earn something. But rather, this fear and trembling is because we've received something of great price. I imagine it like having your first child. You walk into the house, hospital and uh, after many hours, you, are, you receive a new, a, a, your son or a daughter or a baby, and now it's yours. It's this great gift. And you walk out, not with a manual. I heard they don't make those. But from that point on, you, what? you work out your identity as a parent with fear and trembling to earn the baby's favor? No, because you received something of great price. And you'll work out your identity as a parent because of the preciousness of that gift every single day until your second child or so I'm told, right? It gets a little, your fear and trembling goes away a little bit. 
But verse 13 is not an excuse for passivity, but is meant to be an encouragement for believers of their certainty in their activity. Christians don't retire. Their work for holiness after they've trusted in Jesus, it does not go away. See, verse 13 is a promise that God will bless your efforts in seeking to be more like Christ because he will make sure that you are. When Buddha was 80 years old and he knew that he was on the brink of death, he was surrounded by his most loyal followers and he gave them one last teaching. And he said this, And now, O priests, work out your own salvation diligently because each one of you is just what I am. John Nas, who's a professor of philosophy at Franklin Marshall College, reflecting on Buddha's last words to his followers in his book, Man's Religion, he comments that Buddha asked each of his students to reach nirvana or salvation or enlightenment by themselves because neither he nor anyone was able to do that for them. See, salvation was a lonely journey. Sanctification was on your own power and your own responsibility. And if you've messed up, Every mistake will count. See, the gospel tells us a different story. We have, a, we have great reason to work towards Christ-likeness, and the great reason and motivation is that our work is guaranteed by the only one who can do it. So here's a question for us to consider. Are you actively working out to confirm Christ's gift of grace in your life by actively seeking to be more like him? Or have you grown passive and cold in your faith without consciously, consciously thinking of ways you want to be more like Jesus? See, in the midst of social issues happening in our country, do you work out your salvation with as much passion as may, some of you may work out your political party interests, your financial pursuits? In discipleship, have you been actively engaged in discipling people in your life, or do you find yourselves excusing that job for, uh, uh, job, that job for others who are more equipped, or maybe they, you feel like they have more time? In your marriages, are you actively asking your spouse ways you need to repent and change, or have your conversations been avoiding ways to sanctify each other? In your parenting, are you actively asking your children how you failed, and how you can be more like Christ. See, during COVID-19, when it's easier than it's ever been to stay home and not reach out to anybody, have you found yourselves struggling to find creative ways to love people outside of your home who may need love and feel lonely? Or have you secretly excused your responsibility to love your neighbor altogether? Do you work out your salvation more often than you work out your body? And if you're wondering, well, you just told me that it's 100% God, so what's the harm in being passive if God is going to do all the work and he's going to take care of my sanctification? Here's the danger. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he says this. He issues a warning that not everyone who professes to be a Christian is a Christian. And in verse 5, he says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Je Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? And Paul is talking to a church, to Christians. See, genuine faith examines itself repeatedly to make sure that we're working to confirm the gospel our hearts received and believe. You know, when I was thinking, of, when I was on my way to propose to my wife, I made sure every single minute that the ring was in my pocket because <laughs> it was very valuable and I didn't want to lose it. Consider this, in John chapter 5, verse 8, John records the story of a man who was paralyzed and relied on people to get him a little bit closer and a little bit closer to the public pool. But when Jesus meets this man, Jesus gives him the gift of healing. This amazing opportunity, this amazing healing and a gift of grace. And then Jesus, he doesn't say, well, let me pick you up and drag you now. 
to the poor. Well, he doesn't say, well, maybe you haven't walked in a while, so let me just carry you all the way to the pool. You're healed, but let me let's just carry you to the pool. Not at all. He says, pick up your mat and walk. Pick up your mat and walk. See, confirm today the gift that you've received for yourself and confirm it in a way for others to see. There's a story that one evening, Satan gathered his chief of staff to come up with strategies in trying to undermine the work of the gospel. One demon suggested that they disperse the lie that there is no life after death. Then nobody will believe in God. That won't work, said another demon. God created people with this inner desire for eternity, and even atheists have this wondering feeling of what if, so that won't work. I got it, replied another one. Let's say there is a God, but he's dead. Or maybe let's say there is a God, but he just left us, and he's on his own, and we're all on our own. But, but Satan replied, that actually won't work either, because mankind knows there is a God, and even if they don't seek him. Aha, replied a third demon. I have the solution. Let, let's tell people that there is a God, and let's tell people that the Bible is true and it is God's word. Everyone in the room gasped. But he continued. Then we will tell them that Jesus is the son of God and he frees men from their sin to live in holiness. And the room shrieked. And some in the back began wondering whether this was a traitor in their midst. But then this demon cl cleared his throat and lastly said, Then will tell them that today is just not the day to pursue holiness. Tell them there's no hurry. Help them make excuses. Tell them there's something more interesting to do. And then tomorrow, tell them the exact same thing. The room cheered, and each realized that they had just hit the jackpot plan. Church, for some of you, working out your salvation may mean that you pick up your Bible and you read it today. For others of you, it could mean that today is the day when you close your doors and you spend time in prayer, repenting and fellowshipping with your Father. But let me suggest this very practical and what I think is a terrifying step. For some of you, working out your salvation begins, it begins by approaching a trusted mentor maybe a ministry leader, someone that knows you well, your spouse, and it begins by asking them in what ways do they think you need to grow to be more like Christ. And it's terrifying. It's terrifying. But if that is you, I urge you on Paul's promise that, Christ, that God is working in you. And he wants to make you more like Christ today. So we're workers, not retirees, from the moment we trust in Christ until the day we see him face to face. But Paul continues in verse 14 to give us an odd example of what it looks like to work out our salvation. And it is odd because after having explained this amazing reality that God works in us and that we are to work to confirm our salvation, he would expect him to say something like, well, do all things sacrificially, sell all your stuff, give to the poor, go to a foreign country, start a missions group, leave your family. But he doesn't say, say that. But instead, look at verse 14. He says this, how do we work out our salvation? Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, which leads us to our second point. Paul wants us to know that Christians are workers, but we're also lights. In verse 14, Paul instructs Christians that to work out our salvation is to do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, these two sins are not random. And we know that because of what Paul says in verse 15. Now, follow along with me here. In verse 15, Paul wants his readers to know, to remember, the Israelites during their wanderings in the desert. And particularly, 
the greatest sin of the Israelites during the wanderings in the desert, more than worshiping the golden calf, although that was pretty bad and that was a pretty low point in, their, in the Israelites' history, worse than that was their daily, habitual, ever-increasing grumbling, discontentment, and complaining against God. See, it was this grumbling and disputing that led Moses to declare in Deuteronomy 32 as he describes the nation that they are corrupt and they're not God's children. To their shame, they are a warped and crooked generation. See, now, what's the connection between grumbling and discontentment and being a child of God and your identity as a child of God? And it's this, grumbling and disputing at the very root declares that God is my servant, whereas gratitude and contentment declares that God is my father. In other words, Israel's purpose, this chosen nation, this chosen generation was to be a light to the nations around them, that whatever their circumstance they find themselves in, they were pointing to the goodness of God and trust in his love as their heavenly father. But in their grumblings, they've instead made themselves the center of attention and abandoned their calling to be the, the, a light and to be different than the rest. See, when was the last time that you grumbled, that you complained? This month, this week, this morning? Maybe for those of you tuning in at home, you tuned in, you're like, ah, not my favorite preacher, but I'll stick with him, right? Um, Maybe you're grumbling that restrictions are loosening up and now you have to see people more often. And often we believe that small grumbles and small complaints are harmless and sinless. But listen to this. C.S. Lewis, when describing what hell is like, Hell being the final place and form of separation between a person and a God, the ultimate separation. He describes it like this. Hell begins with a grumbling mood. Not a murderer's mood. Not a lustful mood. Hell begins with a grumbling mood. Always complaining, always blaming others, but you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and think you could stop it but there may come a day when you can no longer. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. See, Paul warns that the smallest ounce of grumbling points to a heart that demands people, traffic, children, job, bosses, leadership, politicians, the weather, prices on goods, our pay, and ultimately that God should all work to serve and accommodate us. We don't like it when the weather is too hot or we don't like it when the weather is too cold. We complain when our coworkers are making it harder for us to do our job. And we complain when a coworker is doing a great job because it makes us look bad. We complain when churches are too active. But we also complain when churches are too passive. Just log on to Facebook. Today, it's, been, it's easier than it's ever been to complain about anything. Just read through people's statuses, their opinion on things. It would take you anywhere from 5 to 10 seconds to find someone complaining about something. Now, on a side note, grumbling is not the same as lamenting. And the difference is that grumbling looks to assign blame to someone or something for your misery, while lamenting looks to affirm contentment in God's goodness and his sovereignty in the midst of suffering and trials. So what Paul is saying here to the Philippians is this, remember that you are children of God, that you have a father who's in control. You have a God who worked all things for your good. And remember that God will not allow anything to happen that won't shape you to become more like Christ. And if you remember this truth, if you believe this word of life, this gospel promise, Paul reminds the Philippians that they will be a light and a witness that God is good. That we have an unshakable hope regardless of the circumstances that we're, that we're in. 
See, regardless of who gets elected into office, regardless of whether you're rich or whether you're poor, regardless of whether you're healthy or whether you're sick, regardless of whether you're married or whether you're single, regardless of whether you have kids who are walking in the Lord or whether you have kids who walked away from the faith, whether you're struggling with infertility or other forms of injustice, whether COVID-19 disappears by the end of July or stays until December. See, the gospel we have received reminds us that all things are for our good. So we are content and we become lights in the midst of a grumbling world. But maybe you're sitting here and you're listening or you're listening online and you don't really feel like God is at work in your life. Maybe you feel like you don't feel like lights. Maybe you feel like a candle in the, in the middle of a storm. Maybe you feel like your best efforts to live a Christian life has had more reboots than Batman and Godzilla movies combined. What's the guarantee? What's the guarantee? How can you know that Jesus won't abandon you? How do you know that Jesus is as committed yesterday as as, as committed today as he was maybe the first moments that you utter those words that you want to believe and follow him. What's the guarantee that your work in striving to live for holiness will bear fruit? Which leads us to our third and last point. Jesus sacrificed his life for a city and we are that city. So let me explain the, our last and third point. Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 14, he tells his followers, when he's trying to describe his followers and give them a new identity, he calls them the light of the world. And it's a very famous word, you are the light of the world. But these are not just individual lights dispersed through social distancing. And we tend to think, you know that uh, song, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. It's a catchy song and you repeat it over and over and over. As if we sing that song as if our individual lights are all that matters. And we take pride in our type of light bulb that we have. There are incandescent lights or fluorescent lights, or I have LED lights. And we judge others for having halogen lights. But to clear this misunderstanding, Jesus goes on to explain that this kind of light, when he says you are the light of the world, he says that this is a light that is a city. He goes, on, he goes on to explain that this kind of light is a light that shines with brightness as a city on a hill. See, a city with light is a city with life. A city with light is a city that's bright. See, bright because of its proximity and collaboration to each other. See, when astronauts are in space, they can see cities and nations, not because there's a red marker around different cities and states, but because there's a collective of lights that shines together. See, and this is crucial for us as a church to remember, that Christ died for individual citizens, but he did so to build his bright city. Christ died for individual citizens, but he did so to build his bright city. And the gospel tells us that, this, that the city boundaries have been bought by the cross of Jesus, that the land has been purchased by the blood of the land, the citizens have been gathered by the grace of the king, and now the city is under construction day by day by Jesus, the great architect. See, the perfecter of our faith. Now, where do we find this passage in Matthew? Look with me in verse 17. Verse 17 says this, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, this is Paul speaking, I am glad and rejoice with you all. There is certainty in Paul's words. See, certainty that the Philippians will become the bright city of Christ, not because Paul poured into them, not because of the quality of time and teaching that Paul poured into them, though, although that would have been pretty amazing nor because the Philippian church's works were perfect, but because a greater sacrificial offering has been poured into the lives and every, of every Christian and Philippi and of every believer today. See, the sacrificial offering 
it maintained the relationship between God and man. The sacrificial offering opened the door to, for God to accept the prayers of a broken people and sinful people. And it was the only way for God to have any form of day-to-day -day relationship with his people. So without a proper sacrificial offering, pleasing God is impossible. So it's likely that Paul has Hebrews 10 verse 14 in mind, which says that for by a single offering, Jesus, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And pay careful attention to those words. Those who are being sanctified. And you may find my emphasis on one verb, stingy. But notice that verb. We are being sanctified. Meaning that God has made a permanent contract to keep his relationship with you regardless of the sins you committed today or tomorrow. See, the brokenness you experience day, by, day in and day out, God is still with you. His relationship with you still stands even when your best efforts fall short. Why? Because Christ offered his perfect life as a sacrifice to bind himself to us throughout eternity. And in every season of our sanctification, whether you feel like you've taken 10 steps back, Christ will not forsake you. Whether as a church, because of COVID-19, we feel like we've taken 20 steps back, Christ will not forsake his city. Let me end with this last illustration. If you ever get to visit the city of Barcelona in Spain, and you do a quick Google search of places to see, you will become familiar with a man named Antoni Gaudi. Now, Gaudi was a brilliant architect, and what made him famous was that he paid extreme, excruciating attention to every detail in each of his buildings. See, a door handle was not just a door handle anymore, but Gaudi would study for weeks and weeks on the natural tendency of a human hand to wrap around at door handles. And then he would go on to study nature and leaves and branches and try to assimilate the perfect blend of comfort and beauty in his designs. Everything Gaudi made, from his door handles to his stairs, to the windows, to the walls, to the floors, to the paint, to the color, were all organic and purposeful. And because of his many projects throughout the city, it's easy to see why Barcelona is often referred to as Gaudi City. But in, 19, in 1883, at, at the age of 31, Gaudi took on a contract to work on his greatest project yet. It was a church called La Sagrada Familia. His assignment was to build a church whom his predecessor had abandoned and to make this church reflect God's glory in the city. At once, Gaudi got to work, and he raised the bar. He didn't just want the city to be tall and high, but he raised the bar so that every nook and cranny of this church would contain at least one symbolic element of the gospel story so as to make this the perfect God-honoring structure of all time, ever. And if you do visit, you'll notice that at the very entrance, you can see the Gospel of John. You can trace it out. Gaudi worked all day and all night. At the age of 31, he never married. He lost friends. And there are stories of how Gaudi would not even go home to sleep. He instead would bring a mattress and sleep in his church. Sadly, after 42 years of labor, Gaudi died at the age of 73 in 1926. He left a monster project that was unfinished, and later on, parts of it were destroyed through the Spanish Civil War, and because of the, uh, because of the building's goal and its vision, was, it was so complex and so grand, more than 10 architects quit and refused to finish the church. I mean, who would give their life for this building? To this day, though much progress has been made, the church is still incomplete. There is a new lead architect who is promising to finish the church by 2026, but yet nobody knows because one architect came and left. Friends, church, 
the gospel tells us this amazing story that when God made the world, his desire was to make a holy city. That, but when man rejected God as the architect, they tried to make the city themselves. And generation after generation, the dreams of the city would break with each passing day. An architect would rise, but they would fall short. And eventually only a fool will take on such impossible tasks. Until Jesus came, to take broken, selfish, sinful, rebellious, grumbling people like you and me and transform us into a city of priests where every nook and cranny of our hearts would be holy and radiating radiating with God's glory. And the amazing thing, promise of the gospel, is that this contract with us is one that will never expire. See, Jesus is the architect that never dies. Jesus is the architect (laughs) that will never quit. Jesus is the architect that is at work day and night. Jesus is the architect who lost friends. He never married. He lost his life. And and this contract with us, as Paul reminds us earlier in Philippians, has this fine line, bolded in red, that says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus. See, church, what is the guarantee that Jesus will never forsake us? What is the guarantee that Jesus will bring fruit in all of our efforts in striving for holiness? What is the guarantee that the church will not be under construction forever? The guarantee is this. We have an eternal architect who never dies and is laboring with love. Michelangelo was once asked, how in the world do you make your, your statues the way you do? How do you, how do you envision it? And Michelangelo replied, well, it's very easy, actually. You only have to take away the parts that are, don't belong. You only have to chip away the things to reveal the glory and the image that is hidden. Church, The church may look defeated sometimes, broken. Your Christian lives may look broken, hopeless. But the hope of the gospel is that you have a great architect who is chipping away day and night. He's working day and night to bring out that glory, that great gift of salvation that he's placed in you by faith. So here's the guarantee. We have a great architect. We have a great master who labors with love so that mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, the church waits the consummation of peace forevermore. See, till the vision's glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Brothers and sisters, look upon your architect and be the city of our God on earth. Look upon your architect and strive for holiness with one another today. Look upon your architect and work out this precious gift of salvation you've received from him with joy and delight because it is his great joy and delight to work in you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the great architect of our hearts. You are the great architect of our souls. You are the great architect of your church. And Lord, often we've been at fault at wanting to abandon your church, at at grumbling against your church without being able to see the beauty which you are working every day. And Father, many times we've been deceived in our own spiritual lives, that we are not making any progress. But Lord, you remind us that you are working every day. Not because we earned it, but because your sacrifice guaranteed it. So Father, I pray, Lord, that you will prick our hearts, show us the hope of our labor, so that we may work out this great gift, this great grace, of salvation you've given us individually but also together 
so as to be the city on a hill that is being constructed by Christ every day. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. stand. Father in heaven, it is so easy to grumble and complain. And as we heard, it, it, it's all around us. It seems to be uh, so simple to kick against your guidance and your leading. But Father, what we just sang is our prayer. Lord, that you would give us an ambition, not a selfish ambition, but, Lord, one that is after you and your way. Father, that you would lead us and we would run to follow you. Lord, we're tired sometimes and we don't have that desire. It comes from you, from your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would work in our hearts. And, Lord, as we come to worship you, we do bring an offering to you. Lord, we, we know that that is part of our worship. We ask that that would be pleasing and glorifying to you. And even though we don't pass the plate, Lord, we know that uh, 
it is part of our obligation to return to you a portion of what you have given to us. We thank you for the privilege that it is, Lord, to worship in that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes. Covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy.
seated. Uh, thank you for the awesome teaching today, Jay. That, uh, that was it's praiseworthy and so much to think about uh, and s- examining. Um, so looking at uh, the bulletins and on the website and all that for all the announcements, I think the important thing is that we're going to uh, keep meeting like this um, with the 10 a.m. and the 5 p.m., and we'll adjust as we've been doing for months uh, on how things look. Um, so we'll, we'll keep with that, and we'll uh, make announcements of any change as, as early as we can. Um, what am I missing? That sounds about right. Uh, praise God. Have a good Sunday. <laughs>